Welcome back, everyone, to Open Line, talking with Katie Kaur. She's president of the Nashville Public Education Foundation. That foundation has produced a documentary that's going to be airing, uh, screened really all over the city, talking about our public schools, looking back at its history and looking forward about where we are going and, and, and in a hopeful way, some things that we need to do um, in the future. And, and, and so we've talked a lot about the history and that kind of thing. There's always been in Nashville this struggle, right, about... Mm -hmm. um, what to prioritize, what to prioritize. Growth, um, citizens, growth has been important. Mm -hmm. um, we like to grow. <laughs> we're in a period now where we're really growing. Mm -hmm. What about that struggle and how long has it gone on when you look back over our history? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, not, uh, not unique to Nashville, but many cities obviously are prioritizing and have prioritized for years, generations. Um, economic growth for their citizens, for their businesses, and Nashville is certainly no different. We can look back to the 1800s, in particular to the early 1900s, and then periodically ever since we have these moments where we really make strategic decisions as a city to grow, to be an economic engine uh, for our community. And there's nothing wrong with that. The question that the film poses is to what cost? What are we choosing um, to not invest in, to not prioritize when we prioritize economic growth? And so you look at periods like the 1940s, 1950s, where, uh, the United, where the United States was giving away a ton of urban renewal dollars, and Nashville received many, and we went through a large urban renewal project in East Nashville and in the Capitol Hill area, actually right where we're sitting right here today at WTV. Yeah. Um in the 1940s, if you had looked up at the Capitol, you would have seen this whole area where we are today um, filled with houses. People lived in this neighborhood, which is now, of course, Bicentennial Mall and the Farmer's Market, and you know you don't see very many houses at all. But then it was a quite dense neighborhood. And in the 50s, you saw um, city boosters who really wanted to re-envision the city. And we, we kind of tore down that whole area. We just removed all of those citizens and displaced them so that we could make our city look prettier next to our, our Capitol building. Yeah, um, there are great pictures in there right. of the Capitol and then these kind of, you know, poverty houses yes, that absolutely. are all around the Capitol. Yep. And they're certainly not here now, so we cleaned those out, and we now have, you know, it looks very different. Right. But that's part of this discussion. It is, and, and it really um, was a decision to displace those families uh, to prioritize the growth of the city, to make the city look better uh, to businesses, to tourists, and, um, and we have to wonder what was the right thing to do by those families. You know, we displaced them, we moved them to different parts of the city, we took them away from their own community, and... Um, um, and that's an example of the type of prioritization of growth over the needs of certain community members. Do you think we're in a similar situation right now? I think we have to have some hard conversations about what we are willing to sacrifice to attract big business. And we have some amazing businesses in our city. We have really done an outstanding job getting wonderful new jobs for our community members. And so uh, I'm not an, an economic expert by any means, but I do think we need to question what do we give up when we are trying so hard to attract businesses to Nashville? Um, I don't think that that means that businesses aren't going to come to Nashville or shouldn't come to Nashville. I just think we need to have that hard conversation. All right, let's go to Missy. Is that right? M Missy? Who? Lucy. Who's on, who's Lucy, I'm so sorry, Lucy. I, I got a clue. Yes, sir. Go I'm right ahead, on? Lucy. I'm glad to hear from you. Yes, you're on. Go right uh, ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, uh, people have called in. Mike's called in. I think the guy's name was Rob called in. And... Uh, Rob doesn't see a need for this or understand this critical race theory, and I think you explained it best. History is history. Now, that's an academic term for what we've already studied was history. Good example of not knowing where somebody's coming from, I listened to you tonight, madam, and you gave two points of where this film was being uh, screened in Vanderbilt and downtown, both of which are just hellish to find a place to park in and if you don't have means in some places to get around town it's hard 
so that goes to show this is about everybody being included and how can we go from all these different perspectives but nobody took in the perspective that not everybody has the internet to find out where these other locations are or the means to get downtown yada 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 being being a senior citizen or handicapped or disabled it's just like okay now Maybe this is the premiere or something. I don't know. I'm rambling on right now, but the, I've got uh, some other points to make about this. When people, I, I don't feel guilty at all either. It's history. But when you look at critical race theory, quote unquote critical race theory, and what all it studies, I've studied that stuff. Now, we didn't call it that. But what I've also studied and personally experienced. There's a saying amongst white people, poor white people when I was coming up saying, we're not white enough. I can't wait till I get my white card. And that's part of critical race theory study and those kinds of things too. Mm-hmm. I hope y'all go into that because you're listening to one of uh, the state of Tennessee's morons here that was judged to be a moron that only the only aspiration they had for me was digging ditches so uh, i gotta ask you this did, are y'all covering george peabody's track three system of education mm. in in this documentary and if you are could you talk about that a little bit because okay, i'm a Lucy. victim of that and all right if you're going to talk about that you have to explain what that is um i'm, I'm happy to talk to you. i don't know specifically about the george peabody track system but i do know about the track system and so I'm gonna, I, I think this is where lucy was going to her first point could not agree with you more lucy um i absolutely uh, want to make sure that this film is accessible to all areas of our community and so we are doing a variety of different things to roll out the film in v- every neighborhood that we can think of including home screenings in different uh, private viewings and so I, I hope we can find a viewing for you and, and that you'll be able to access in the future um, to the second point uh, with tracking the film actually does talk about uh, the effect of tracking in our system and, and what that means means is that uh, when I was coming up in the school system, it, it, it tr- the, the system itself chose whether or not certain students were going to be on a college prep track and take certain courses that would prepare them to apply to colleges, or they would be on a vocational track where you, you might be in woodworking or, um, or some other classes that would prepare you for a job potentially after high school. That system showed uh, not just racial bias, but also bias, as Lucy was pointing out, um, of many groups of people that that the counselors who were making those decisions or the teachers who were making those decisions about which classes a student was going to take um, actually uh, were biased in those decisions. And so you did see a, um, a lot more black students tracked into the vocational coursework and not have an opportunity to take those college prep classes. You also saw that happen with special education students, with certain other white students and different groups of students. And so the tracking system itself is no longer in our public school system, but certainly implicit bias affects whether or not a student has access to certain coursework today. That was in the film. And there was that, there's a picture of, I guess business going upstairs, yeah. vocational going downstairs. Yes. I don't and know what, if that was at McGavick. It was. It at, was. Yeah, yeah. McGavick High mm-hmm. School, and and then the talk about okay, so we. It's no it, longer at McGavick, by the well, way. Yeah, that, so was that was from the eighties. Yeah. Picture. Yeah. So. But so we integrated, but then within these large integrated schools, mm-hmm. there was again this divide, segregation, right. whatever. And right. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. So yeah. tracking, Lucy bringing that up. Yeah, I appreciate that, that question so much, Lucy. Thank you. Lucy also saying, okay, I said the first place you're going to screen it. You, you, there are other places you're going to screen it. Mm-hmm. The goal here, again, is what? It's not just a couple of places. Churches could ask for it. What what is the goal? Yeah, we are um, we're we're doing some public community screenings that you know we're inviting anyone in the public can come. But we also are encouraging organizations, businesses, um, individual families, and community members to host screenings of their own. And so we will give access to anyone who is interested in the film um, to screen with their community members or their families. And we also have a series of of resources that go along with that. We have a watch guide. 
provide a series of questions that help prompt conversation. We do encourage community members to watch it in community. So whatever community means to you, um, that can be you know your family and close friends, that can mean um, a PTA, that can mean your business or your your you know your nonprofit, um, whatever that means to you. But we do we do want you to watch it with somebody else because we think that the value of this film is really the conversations that you have um, afterwards in reflection on the topics that are discussed. And you're a historian. You're obviously passionate about public schools. And so as you helped put this together, what kind of surprise, is there something that surprised you? Is there something that it kind of was like, whoa, that, that really is something there? Or was there some surprise for you? Or what, what was a big takeaway for you as you helped put all of this into what we have here. There, there were so many, I, it, it, but but one of the most prominent ones, um, I, I knew that we had always under-resourced communities of color in our in our history, particularly black communities. I knew that, that we as a nation have not um, done by our black citizens the way that we should have. I mean, that was just a given, and we've all known that through our history lessons. Uh, what I didn't know about Nashville's history, which is somewhat unique, um, is that not only did we under-resource black communities in our city, but we actually actively removed resources from those communities. And I'll give you two examples in Nashville. Um, I, I came to uh, WTVF tonight via I-40 um, interstate, and that interstate was built in in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, um, and we of course had to decide at the time where the interstate was going to be built. And the city leaders at the time decided that it would go straight through Jefferson Street, which is, of course, if you're from Nashville, you know, is a very vibrant and was an absolute epicenter of our black community um, in Nashville. And so that that interstate stripped out one of the most vibrant uh, black economic and social aspects of our community. Um, so again, just removing something from it. The other critical example I think that you'll see in the film is, um, and you'd be remiss not to talk about the wonderful Pearl High School in Nashville. Pearl, of course, um, if you're in Nashville now, you know about Pearl Cone High School, but the original high school, Pearl High School, was founded in the 1880s, and um, it really was the preeminent black high school for generations. And in the 1980s, under court order, our system had to desegregate, and by desegregate, it meant that you had to have a white majority in every school. And so Pearl was an all-black school at the time and was unable to attract a majority white population. And so in the 1980s, our school board closed this really hallmark of our community. It's now Martin Luther King, which is a fantastic school, and I'm so happy about that. But it, it closed this bedrock of our community and, and it removed that amazing resource um, from our black community members. So just two examples, that those were both just shocking to me and I knew a little bit about Pearl closing but I didn't quite realize the effect that it had had on Black Nashville. That's handled really well in the documentary. You talked to, who was it, Melvin Black or somebody who went mm -hmm. to, yeah, it was, it's really well done. All right, we'll take a break, come back, continue the discussion. Be back right after this.